welcome to a special edition of the No Dunks Podcast. I'm Lee Ellis. Today I welcome to the program a guest who is very well known in the cricket world. A glorious and exquisite batsman, a handy medium pace and spin bowler, and still the finest slips catcher the game has ever seen. He won everything from the World Cup to multiple Ashes series and had a huge hand in Australia recapturing the Frank Worrell Trophy after almost 20 years in West Indian keeping. A Hall of Famer who made about the same amount of runs in both Test Cricket and the One Day Game, in all scoring over 16,000 for his country, and he even registered a fifer as a bowler in both forms of the game, cementing himself as one of the most versatile cricketers in history, and he did it all while having the best hair in the dressing room throughout his entire (laughs) career. And he joins me on the line from Central Coast, New South Wales right now. He is Mark War. Mark, welcome to the No Dunks Podcast. G'day, Lee. Yeah, that was a good introduction. Not sure about the best hair in the dressing room, but um, <laughs> yeah, we'll take that. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I, I did have a pretty good mullet there when I first started playing for Australia. Yeah, well, I, I think it was the style, wasn't it, in that, that the late 80s, early 90s? Everyone kind of had one, really. Yeah, if you didn't have a mullet, you weren't up to speed. So, um, yeah, I just copied everyone else and, and thought it uh, looked okay at the time. Looking back, it probably wasn't the best uh, hair, <laughs> but at least I had some hair then. It's sort of uh, thinned out quite a bit since oh, those is that days. right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, look, in preparing for this, Mark, uh, look, I followed your career very closely anyway, and I, and I listened to a few other podcasts you've been on, so I'm going to try to avoid some of the questions that you've probably been asked, the same sort of questions, so it's hopefully not too repetitive for you, and also to give our listeners, which is, is, is you know probably an audience that isn't familiar as much with cricket and yourself, a bit more of an idea of who you are and, and what made you great at cricket. Okay. So I'll I'll start though where it all began because I know you were very naturally gifted when it came to sports. You know, mum and dad were very good athletes. Uh, you were good at soccer and tennis, golf and cricket. But what I want to know is, was there a sport that you tried as a kid that you just weren't any good at? You know, swimming or karate or, or distance running, something like that. Well, I mean, all ball sports um, we sort of we've played. Mum and dad were good tennis players, of course, and. My uncle was a very good cricketer. He was the leading run scorer for Bankstown Cricket Club, you know, the, the club that we played for when we were growing up. So there was always sport in the family. I must admit, I wasn't very good at water sports, you know, like surfing right. and, and those sorts of things, uh, skateboarding, <laughs> you know, the, those sort of things where skiing, where you needed a bit of balance. Even though I looked quite balanced on the cricket field, like right. my balance on those sorts of things wasn't very good. So anything to do with a, with a ball, I was pretty good at. Anything other than without a ball, not so good at. Yeah, because I imagine, you know, at school and stuff, uh, any time there was a ball sport, the other kids are probably like, you know, I mean, the war twins here are going to are gonna be pretty good at it. Um, and, and, you know, speaking of that, like I, I, playing cricket in Australia in the summer, every every kid does it. But I don't imagine it was a whole lot of fun for the neighbours of the war family <laughs> to turn up and play unless I just wanted yeah. to bowl all afternoon. Is that is that right? Well, our neighbours probably didn't play. It was, it was more our younger brothers, Dean and Danny, who were... Right. Uh, Ten years younger, Danny yeah. and Dean's four years younger, so they didn't get much for a battle of the bowl. They were just fielding most of the time. So I was myself and Stephen doing all the batting and bowling. So they were probably the the ones that um, got the rough end of the stick. And yeah. in actual fact, Danny and Dean both ended up very good fields, and probably because that's all they did <laughs> when they were in the backyard um, playing cricket with their older brothers. So yeah, we didn't um, sort of play a lot with with the neighbours. It was more with the family itself. And then right. every now and then, mum and dad would sort of get involved as well. But um, it was just sport 24 hours a day. As soon as you got back from from school, well, not 24 hours, we did sleep, yeah, but, of course, but as soon as we yeah. got back from school in the afternoons, we'd just play cricket or soccer or whatever, tennis um, as well. Uh, they were the main three sports. And soccer and cricket sort of, uh, we got to a really good level, myself and Stephen, sort of as teenagers, and we had to make a choice sort of in the late teenage years, you know, which sport we'd sort of follow through with, and that was cricket. Yeah, so speaking of that, um at the time, I mean, soccer's always been a big sport, but it probably wasn't that big in Australia at that time. Given the way that soccer is now, I mean, if you go back in time, do you think there's any chance that maybe you, you pursue soccer instead and maybe you're, you're lining up for Man United or, or Real Madrid or something like that? Or, or, or yeah. was it always just cricket just always had that pull? Well, it was always sort of 50-50. Well, myself and Stephen are probably pretty good at both sports on a, on a level level par, but um there's a guy called Robbie Slater who uh, went on to play for Australia and he commentates on Fox Sports now. He went, in, went on to play in England and France. We were actually in the same teams as him all the way through right. our junior soccer. We came from the same area. So I, I thought actually myself and Stephen were better players than Robbie when we were younger. So <laughs> you never know. Look, look, you don't know. 
Yeah. Um, but, I mean, we did pretty well at cricket, so it's, it's hard to say whether we would have had the same impact at soccer. Um, you right. just don't know. But, um, you know, we feel that we we made the right move. There's probably a bit more money involved in soccer in yeah. those days. Probably not now with the IPL and those sorts of things. Cricket's, you know, you can earn a lot of money at the highest level if, you, if you're if you a really good player. So back in those days, probably there was more money in soccer if you went, went to Europe, of course. Yeah. Are you a little bit surprised that Australia hasn't really done better on the world stage in soccer i know in 2006 we made it out of the group stage but other than that i mean when was it 2018 i think we only scored two goals and they were both penalties at the world cup we seem to have sort of taken a bit of a step backwards uh, in, in that respect are you surprised that we haven't given australia's passion for sport and our development and infrastructure there we haven't been able to to you know get uh, better results mm. well a little bit but i mean our, our best team was probably what, uh, about eight years ago, I reckon, we were very competitive uh, in World Cups. We're probably, you're right, we've probably taken a little backward step in men's soccer, but women's soccer is probably, we've gone up the other way. Right. So, look, I, I don't know the reasons. Maybe the population, we don't have the same population as, as the big countries in soccer to produce players. Um, but it, it probably stems from our A-League, how strong that is, and, and yeah. maybe you know, players getting overseas experience, whether that happens as much now, I'm not sure. But, um, I mean, we do okay, really, for the population we've got. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I want to start with your one-day career because that's where your career started for Australia. Um, you know, you started there about three years before you got your, your, your chance in the test team. But uh, what was interesting about your one-day career? When you came into the team, I don't know if you remember your first game, you didn't get a bat or a bowl. It was a pretty easy... Yeah, I do, win, actually, win. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but then, you, you know, you started to... Uh, you, you were shuffled around the order a lot. You were batting at, you know, four and five and three. And it wasn't really, you know, you were in and out of the side a little bit. It wasn't until a, a weird sort of five-game tour of New Zealand in 93 mm. where you opened. And apart from one game, you had either a 50 or a 100. And you really, it, it showed at that time the game was changing, really shifting away from basically just the test team being the one-day team. And someone like yourself, who was a middle-order test batsman, opening the, uh, opening the, the, the batting for mm. Australia. And it had real success. But after that tour... Then you kind of went back down to sort of batting three, four, and five. It wasn't until like 95, 96 uh, where you did sort of cement your place there as an opener. So how did that yeah. 93 tour come about, and then why didn't it continue for, for a couple of years? Well, when I first played for Australian ADIs, I was batting at sort of six and well, five and six. I could, yeah. I'd never got a bat. I'd come in the last four or five overs. It was a little bit frustrating because we had a, a good top order um, and they took up most of the overs, to be honest, David Boone and Jeff Marsh, Alan Border, <laughs> yeah. those sorts of guys. So I'd come in right at the end and get a handy little 15 or 16. So I was a little bit frustrated, but um, on that tour to New Zealand, you're talking about in 93, I got yep. dropped from the test team and Alan Border just came up to me at the start of the one days and said, you know, do you want to open the batting? And I said, yes, of course I do. And then I had a lot of success there, opening the batting. Uh, and then... I pretty much stayed at the top there for the rest of my career. It might have been a few series there where I, I, I wasn't opening, but um, yeah. yeah, I mainly stayed there from then on at the top. Well, I remember because then there was the Ashes Tour of 93, and, and you and Alan Border actually had a huge partnership in the one-day mm. game. Uh, I think it was Headingley, maybe Edgebaston, where um, you know, mm. Robin Smith made 160 in, in the English innings. That's right, yeah. And then you and Alan Border, you had 113. AB, I think, had 86. And But that was, again, surprising because you didn't open that game. You, you know, you no, well, in... I think well, on, on an Ashes tour when you're playing one day, you, you basically got, you got the same squad for the tests and the one right. day. So, you know, you pretty much... You know, keep the, the openers from the test matches in the one days. It's right. like there was two separate teams, so that's probably the reason why I didn't open. You know, they, I, I assume they went with um, Jeff Marsh and Mark Taylor. Probably, I think it was. Um, I think Hayden actually opened. Um, oh, Hayden, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I think, the, uh, yeah. Test, your memory is better than mine, but yeah, yeah well, it's mainly because <laughs> it's because it's not like a specialist um, tour for uh, for one days. You, you, you yeah. got the same players mixing, so. I guess they just wanted to keep the test players, you know, at the top of the order opening in the, in the one days. Yeah, well, so, you know, speaking of my memory, I mean, I, I do, I was a big cricket fan growing up as a kid. I mean, it was it was great. Obviously, you know, in Australia, everyone follows it. But when I was researching and preparing for this, you know, I was really going down some YouTube rabbit holes and looking back at, <laughs> at, at, at over, you know, especially your career because, um, it, you know, it was so influential for me how I played the game. Now, I, I, you know, I never played any high level, but I was always trying to bat like Mark War out there. <laughs> um 
And I even uh, I even had the uh, thigh pad, you know, and everything. I had all, yeah, yeah. I had all the all of the Slazenger gear out there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in 1996, uh, the World Cup there. You, personally, you had an incredible tournament. Uh, you, you got a couple of centuries at the start there. But uh, what I what I really noticed was how similar the semi-finals were in '96 and then '99 against South Africa. In '96 against the West Indies, Australia four for 15 after nine overs. Mm. And then uh, Bevo and Stewie Law steadied. We got to 207, but it was like, that's not going to be enough against the West Indies. They were then cruising yeah. at two for 165 with nine overs yeah, to go. Right. Before. Yeah, I mean, they fell apart. And then three years later in England against South Africa, 213 Australia made there. Another bit of a slow start. Steve got a good 50. South Africa's cruising, none for 48 without loss. Then Warney comes in. And takes those three wickets, two and a half wickets, I will say, because uh, I think yeah. Kanye just uh, just sort yeah. of shuffled well, it. Well, it, look, it looked out actually. I thought <laughs> yeah. it was out live. Is that right? So, foot. Yeah. Well, so I, I was watching that over and over again. I think Warney was just trying to sort of, you know, con the umpire a little bit. He was charging down there. You almost sort of hesitated a little bit when you caught it, as if like. I'm not sure he hit that, but everyone else is going crazy. Um, and Hansi didn't like it. He, he didn't want to go at all, but uh, it, it was... Yeah. Well, that, that was one of those dismissals that actually looked out live. You right. know, if you were the umpire, you can understand why he gave it out because it yeah. looked like it, it hit the edge of the bat. Um, obviously, it sort of come out of the footmarks, and I think Cronje might have hit his foot at the same yeah. time. But to the naked eye, it actually looked out. So yeah. You, know, yeah. you couldn't say it was a bad decision. No, uh, even though he wasn't out, it was just one of those things. But um, yeah, that '96, uh, the '99 semi-final against South Africa, that was the, the most memorable one-day game of cricket I've played in. I mean, that was yeah. amazing. It was so nerve-wracking to play in it, let alone watch it. It's probably worse watching actually if you're a fan. You, you know, and I was feeling it uh, deep mid off a lot of the time when Lance Clusen was batting, and he was yep. hitting the ball so hard. He never missed hit a ball. Yeah, that, that whole tournament. Until right at the end in that over, Damien Fleming bowling, he missed hit a couple. That was the only time he missed hit a ball. So you, you sort of, as it feels, when you you sort of want the ball probably not to come to you, even yeah. though, you know, you, <laughs> as it feels, when you should want it to come to you. But at that stage of the game, it's, it's so nerve-wracking. And one little mistake, you can lose the game. And we dropped, Paul Rifle dropped a catch. Oh. Damien, uh, Darren Lehman missed the run out uh, yep. in that, what was the last over from point-blank range. And, so they said that South Africa cracked under pressure, but we really did as well uh, a couple of times. We had our chances to win that game. And as it turned out, I was lucky enough to field the ball at mid-off and do the backhand flick, which just yeah. missed the stumps. Yeah, that's then, so yeah. were you trying to run out basically whoever was at that non-striker's end? I yeah. Mean, were you, yeah, you were. I thought so. But yeah, no, uh, it, I was just concentrating on picking the ball up first of all because it was a bit of a, a scungy shot, sort of yeah. a, bounce, a bit rough to me just off the edge of the square. So... You know, I just come across in one motion, picked it up and flicked it. The, the backhand flick, I sort of learnt from playing indoor cricket when I was a right. young, you know, youngster. So it was quite a natural, you know, throw for me, the backhand flick. So it wasn't like it was a, you know, a really um, extravagant bit of fielding. I was quite used to doing that flick. I was just dirty. didn't hit the stumps, actually. Yeah. Um, do you but, think um, how much... Cleaned it up. Yeah. How, how, I mean, so two things as well about that. How much do you think the ball prior where Donald basically did back up a little too much and he nearly got run out by Buff there, did that affect him what he did on that next next one? Because I think Klu, Klusner was probably in the wrong, wasn't he, for calling him through yeah. there? Well, he shouldn't have called him through. I think there was still three balls left in the yeah. over, two or three. Now, if I got to the last, last ball, you'd obviously have to run. But I, I would have thought Klusner would back himself to hit you know, hit a, hit a run from the next two deliveries. You know, so they just panicked. You know, they didn't have to run on that delivery. They, they got away off the previous one where there was a mix-up and, and Darren missed the stumps. They, they just, what they should have done was Lance Clues said, OK, we're not running. I've got the next two balls. I'm going to back myself to hit it through the field. Yeah. If I don't happen to hit it uh, through the field, then we've obviously got to run from the last yeah. ball. But they, they just... Um, yeah, they, they stuffed up, really, let's be honest. Yeah, well, uh, you know, you mentioned the poor rifle drop catch. I mean, it wasn't just a drop catch, but he, he, he spooned it over. Yeah, he spooned it over the fence yeah. of six. I mean, um, you know, you, look, you're in a World Cup. You're all on the same team, of course. But how, how deflating is that when you're just like, that could have been the <laughs> game right there. And, yeah. and instead, well, you know, you almost give it, hand it over mm. to them. And he had good hands too, poor yeah. rifle. Obviously from Victoria, where you are, you're from Victoria. Ain't That's you? right. Yep. Even being an AFL player, you know, it was a perfect <laughs> AFL catch, wasn't it? Just above the head. So he that's had right. very good hands. So that's just pressure. And, you know, that happens when you're under pressure. You can make a mistake. So, 
at the time we all dropped our heads a bit, but in the end yeah. it, was, it was all okay. Yeah, well, um, and then, you know, when you, when you get to the final, you play Pakistan in the final there, and a bit of a fizzer really, wasn't it, the final? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, you didn't have to chase all that many. I think you finished about 37 not out in the end, but it was you're only yeah. chasing 120-odd. Um, but given the fact the two games prior, I mean, you, you, you guys were gone against South Africa in the game before that until Herschel yeah. drops the catch. Yeah, uh, off Steve, Steve yeah. of course. Now, is is it true what Steve said to him? I mean, I know it's out yeah. there, but he said that. He said, he said something like, "What's on the record?" Yeah, it's hard to get much out of Stephen, but um, <laughs> it, it was, it was, I think, pretty much like what's been in the in the, you know, in the press and what's yeah. what's around the around the place that you just dropped the World Cups on that. It was something similar, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, the you know Herschel, like he, he he threw the ball away too. It wasn't like he fumbled it. He he just no, he, he caught he it, threw, but he. Yeah, it's just a bit impetuous in in celebrating, and oh. as he went, to, it was it's crazy yeah, it was, stuff. Like he's he's a good fieldsman too. He's got great hands. So, yeah, um, but, but almost too it, cocky with it though. Like you know, I've I've got this and uh, ended yeah. up dropping it. Um, just going. Can you quickly. hear the donkey in the background there? No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, there's an eagle going on it. Oh, farm, right, yeah. right. I, no, I, I saw right. I saw a Play little on. news clip on him, and uh, he moves pretty well out there. Uh, by the looks of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought Kim Kim hasn't tried to get him out on the track, has she? And uh, see if he can. Uh, well, he would. He, he gets in the way enough. He's always in the way. <laughs> you know, you're driving around the farm in your your farm vehicles. He's always running in front of you or next to you or something. Or right. Up and down the, the fence line, taking on the on the thoroughbreds. Yeah, and no, he thinks he's not sure whether he's a horse, a donkey, a dog, or a human. He's, he's a bit of everything. Yeah, <laughs> he likes the ice creams though. Uh, he does. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's good on the tooth. Good on the tooth. <laughs> Oh, we got some big news from our favorite security company, Simply Safe. They just launched their new wireless outdoor security camera. That's right, Simply Safe. You know Simply Safe. It's the system that US News and World Report names best home security system of 2021. Yes, that's Simply Safe. I got it here at the house and it's great and it just got even better. This brand new outdoor security camera is engineered with all the bells and whistles. <laughs> doesn't say bells and whistles it says advanced tech and security features that you want and need to help keep you and your family safe bells and whistles though great idea for a security system because the bells and whistles could go off to alert you of intruder or an emergency or something but i digress this camera has an ultra wide 140 degree field of view so you can keep watch over your entire yard it has 1080p hd resolution with an eight times zoom that means you can zoom Zoom in and clearly see things like faces and license plates to capture critical evidence. Plus you get to say, enhance, enhance. It's got a built-in spotlight with color night vision so you can keep an eye on what's going on day and night. And it's super simple to set up and usually takes just minutes. And it has an easy to remove rechargeable battery so it doesn't need an outlet and can go anywhere on your property. This camera has it all. And it integrates with your Simply Safe home security system, extending its protection to the outside. Together, it means every door, window, and room are protected. And now, your property will be too. To learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com slash no dunks. Wait, 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 there's more. Simply Safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash no ducks. What's up, guys? I'm here to talk about Everlane. Everclear? No, that's a band. That was a 90s band. They sang Santa Monica. I'm talking about Everlane, guys. Not Everclear, you idiots. Ha! <laughs> Everlane, man, I love it. I've talked about uh, owning the men's French Terry Crew sweater, sweatshirt, I guess. I love it. It's a classic. I would wear it by a fire happily. I've said that before. It's just a good look for someone like me. It's a good look for everybody, if we're being honest. And it says in the text here for this Everlane copy, that I can share different activities that I would wear this piece to. Well, I already told you I'd wear it at a fire. But it says, for example, cooking at home, exploring a local farmer's market, or a solo afternoon stroll. Hell yeah, Everlane. I would wear this sweatshirt doing all three of those things. Cooking, 
exploring the local farmer's market? Just a stroll? If it's cold enough, I'm wearing this sweatshirt because it's baller. I'm wearing it for everything. Because it's timeless. Everlane has everything you need to upgrade your look. Whether you're going out on the town with friends or having a movie night with the fam. Or strolling in the afternoon. Hey honey, have you seen my strolling sweatshirt? It's uh, it's three o'clock. I gotta get out there. Um, look good, feel good is what I'm saying though. From workout to takeout, swimwear to track wear, styles for lounging at home or hitting up your favorite late night spot. My God, do they really want to get it clear to you in this copy that you can wear these clothes anywhere? And you can, cause they're clothes and they're great. They got breathable, organic cotton track wear. Gives an elevated sort of take on the tried and true basics, I like that. And for those beach days or pool parties, you can check out Everlane's sustainable swimwear collection. Made from over 13,000 pounds of recycled plastic, I like that. So go to everlane.com slash no dunks and sign up for 10% off your first order plus free shipping. And get easy returns within 30 days for your ship date. That's 10% off your first order when you go to everlane.com slash no dunks and sign up. Get yourself a stroll and sweater is what I say. Uh, just quickly back to the 96 World Cup I mentioned, you know, personally you had an incredible tournament there. Um, you know, you got the 126 against India and then to top it off, when Sachin Tendulkar's just on a tear, you get him with the uh, the yeah, crazy stumped. white. Yeah, stumped off a white. Ravi Shastri in the commentary box is saying, uh, oh, Mark War spot, spotted Tendulkar coming down the track. I mean, is that true, or is that just yeah, was that just of one of the best bad balls you've ever bowled? No, no, it was, it was, of course it was. He, he played for the spin as well, which is a big mistake from Sachin. But, uh, no, I pushed it through quicker and a bit wider. But, um, yeah, I mean, that tournament, I, I did have a good t- tournament, particularly at the start. I would have liked a few yeah. more runs in the semi and the final, obviously. But um, at the start of the tournament, I was, I was playing well. And that 100 against India in Bombay or Mumbai was probably one of my best you know, one day hundreds uh, in my career, I think. Oh, yeah, that that was uh, incredible to watch. I mean, that was an incredible match. And again, I think if you don't get Tendulkar out then, yeah. I think India probably goes on to win that because he was just, he was hammering uh, McGrath all over the place. And, and yes. the, the pace was, the because those those ball, those pitches aren't super fast, are they? they their ball no. sort of sits up a bit, yeah. Yeah, they're not super fast, but um, I mean, Tendulkar was a great player. So, you know, yeah. you, know you don't, you know, you almost expect him to win win games under pressure for India, and he was pretty much doing that until a, a masterful bit of spin bowling. So I <laughs> and then the yeah, uh, the chase, Bennett, the one that doesn't turn is a beautiful arm ball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the chase against New Zealand. Uh, you know, because it was Chris Harris and Lee yeah. on who, uh, you know, Chris Harris. I think he'd 130 that game, and uh, and you you made another ton in that game. Incredible century. But that was also when and Tubbs threw out Shane Warne to just sort of mix it up. And uh, Deepak Patel dropped him. But then Warney, I think, hit three sixes. He made 30, and it really got the team going again. Uh, that's nothing you don't really see anymore, though, in the game, is it? Like Because everyone kind of mm. plays with that aggressive uh, aggressive way from the start now. Is that is that a fair uh, assessment of the current um, one-day game? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you see it a little bit where players are shuffled up the order just to go in and pinch hit. You know, I think there's occasions you, you, you do see it these days. Um, in those days, it wasn't seen that often. But if you remember the World Cup uh, in 1990 in Australia, New Zealand and Sri Lanka sort of changed the way yeah. it was played. You know, they're pinch hitters at the top, scoring quickly. Um, but, yeah, Warney, yeah, he, he came in a little cameo. I remember that innings in Madras. I, I actually, we fielded first and it was yeah. so hot. Oh, I yeah. think I might have bowled 10 overs as well. Yeah. And Chris Harris... And Lee Jamon got runs. We didn't talk about them much in the in the meeting the night before. That two bats we didn't we didn't focus on. But um, when I first went out the bat, uh, there was not much of a break between our innings in the field and then going straight at the bat. And I, at the start of my innings, I actually started to cramp up in my calves, which I never cramp up at all. I thought, geez, this is going to be bad if I'm cramping up early on. But I, I managed to get through the innings, obviously in those conditions. Chris Harris, who was made runs he went out to bowl he couldn't even run he was yeah. cramping up running into bowl I remember that so yeah conditions were really tough uh, and I mean that innings was probably not far behind my innings against India you know, in the in the lead-up game so 
yeah, a couple of big big hundreds in, in tough conditions. It's always, uh, you know, feels good when you do that and, and get your team over the line, of course. Oh, I, I'm sure it does because, again, it's different when you're defending versus having to chase 280, uh, you know, because a couple of wickets can really turn turn the contest back into the team that's defending there. But uh, as I say, you got the 100, then uh, Warney came out there and, and yeah. just nice little pinch hit. But uh, yeah. I, I want to shift now a little bit now to your, to your test career because you obviously started at Adelaide. We know about the big century there. But I want to go actually to your first tour, which was to the West Indies, to the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, they were still a force. Um, and they won that series pretty comfortably in the end. I know you got a century, I think, in the last test match there. Um, but then the following season, 92-93, Australia's on the brink of winning the Frank Worrell Trophy. We only need 186 on that last day in Adelaide. And it disaster struck. I mean, uh, you know, like Kirtley and Courtney came in, and I think it was Tim May made 42, nearly yeah. nearly uh, steered Australia home. Um, so, And then a week later in Perth, uh, Australia... Really did just look out class. Curtly, Curtly uh, Ambrose had that incredible spell, seven for one, and they recaptured yeah. it. And for Australia to be on the brink of, of defeating the nation, the country you know that had dominated us for so yeah. long, I mean, it must have just been devastating. I know Alan Border was obviously for him, especially towards the end of his career there, to have the to have the Frank Wall Trophy in his hands and and basically lose it in Adelaide and then and then. Yeah. Western Australia, Perth. It was just, it was all over. I mean, what was it like for you, still early into your career at that point? Well, I mean, the West Indies were a great team, you know, through the eighties and the early nineties. They, they were the benchmark. They were so dominant, and you really didn't expect to beat them when you played against them. I remember my first tour to the Caribbean, um, where I, I did pretty well actually. But I just remember the atmosphere in our squad. You know, was a bit um, negative. You know, we just we were just there to, to turn up and play without really having the, the confidence to beat them. So. That was a little bit disappointing from my point of view, but personally, I was very uh, happy with the tour. Even though I was playing some of the the guys I'd looked up to, guys yeah. like Viv Richard, you know, you're on the same field as those guys. I mean, I remember their side. They had Haynes, Greenwich, Richards, Richardson, Dujon, Logie, yeah. um, Malcolm Marshall, yeah. Walsh, Ambrose, Bishop. You know, you don't get a much better team than that, and, <laughs> and you're almost in all playing against those guys. Um, yeah. So. To be on the same field in the same dressing was it was amazing. But um, after that, uh, obviously, you're talking about in Australia where Adelaide, where Craig McDermott was yeah. given out. Daryl Hare gave him out. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was out or not. But um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, that, that, uh, no, it was given yeah. out, and it was so frustrating to lose, to be so close and lose that test, then go to Perth, and let's let's just give the West Indies the best pitch they can possibly bowl on a fast yeah. bouncy pitch. <laughs> With some grass on it, let's just, let's just make it a little bit harder for ourselves. And um, Kirtley Ambrose was just too good on, in those conditions. It was yeah. ready made for their quick bowlers and yeah. so close in that series. But, um, yeah. you know, so far, Alan Border was so disappointed because he just copped a hammering his whole career playing yeah. against the oh. West Indies. So and, 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 you know, frustrating you for him. You mentioned it there as well. Like every kid, the thing about the West Indies is like they tortured us all in the, in the 70s and 80s there. But we also kind of like. Being, well, we all wanted to be Viv Richards as kids. It's like, yeah. I want to be Viv Richards. You know, I want to be uh, like the cool guy who just comes out there, no helmet, you know, chewing yeah. on the gum, the collar up, hitting sixes all over the place. And it was like, these, these, this, this team just comes out here and pounds us every time they come out. But they're so much enjoyable. They're so much fun to watch. They're so enjoyable. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, he was my, my idol, Viv Richards. So. Yeah. And all the description you just said of him, that's that's what made him such a special player. But uh, they did not have a bad player in their squad. They, no. they really didn't. So, no. And they had that aura about them. Um, everyone just loved watching him play. Yeah. Well, so that brings us then to 95. Uh, and, and obviously one of the most, if not the most significant tour and series victory of your career. I, I, I'm sort of saying this myself because I, 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 there's maybe there's something else, but it, just because of all that history and all that drama that have been around there, then you go back to the West Indies. And ironically, the series kind of went the same way as it did in Australia. You guys uh, won the first test. I think it was a draw in the second test. And then the third test, there was like uh, 234 runs total scored. Yeah. And Australia lost by an innings. I don't know. I just I was I was looking over that and I was thinking, how did that happen? I don't know. The pitch must have just been an absolute uh, uh, minefield. Well, it, was. it was. was. It was a shocker in um, Port of Spain. Yeah. Yeah. The pitch was very damp, and you just needed luck to get runs. And um, you know, you, you're facing those sorts of bowlers on those sort of pitches. It's very tough. So yeah, I mean, 
one all going into Jamaica, into Kingston, which is traditionally um, a tough place to play for a touring oh, yeah. team. And yeah, we just we just got it done. Myself and Stephen put on that great partnership, and and then we end up winning that game pretty easy. So it, it was really the change of the guard. I mean, change in the you know the the the, the people who are in. You know, the best in, in world cricket, the West Indies have dominated for probably 10 to 15 years and then we, yeah. we took over and since then we've sort of uh, kept progressing and the West Indies unfortunately, um, you know, have, have gone a bit a bit the other way. Yeah, you, you might recognise this. It's the uh, the Warpath photo. The, yeah, the, yeah. Ch- just, ch- ch- yeah. Yeah, I do. I do recognise that. So, I mean... Yeah. I, I picked that up as as soon as they uh, had it for sale. I picked it up. It was yeah. only 150 bucks. It's worth. Uh, That's cheap. But yeah. that, that 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 ground, um, Kingston, Jamaica, is so intimidating. You know. It's, yeah. It's, the crowd just want blood. You know, they love seeing <laughs> guys get hit in the helmet, and you know, it's just an amazing, um, amazing place to play. I must admit, when I went out to bat in that first innings, I wasn't confident at all. It's funny. Look, right. I, you know, I was just hoping to get runs, and then I got through the first 20. I think David Boone was out before me, he got, I think he brushed his helmet actually, he got given out caught behind a bouncer flying through and then, you know, the crowd are just off their, off their rocker and yeah. I went out to bat and I think I got a bouncer first ball, well I ducked it anyway, I don't think it was yeah. that short but I thought a bouncer was coming and I got underneath it, managed to get through the first 20 minutes and then I was right, the pitch was a good pitch to bat on, obviously Stephen played a great innings at the other end um, and that sort of set up, set up the win. Yeah, I, I, I heard on another podcast you were on that uh, your dad, who used to uh, run a news agency, he, he, if ever there was negative stuff written in the papers, he used to hide them up the back. So uh, no yeah, one. He, re- did, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't like the Australian newspaper too, right. too, too much. Not that they sold many copies out in the west of Sydney, the Australian anyway. Yeah, I bet. Uh, I bet after the uh, after that win in Jamaica, there he probably moved a few more copies that that following. They were probably like, "Geez, why are we selling so many at the War News Agency today?" <laughs> yeah, he, he took it a bit personal, Daddy. Yeah, he never never used to like when we got any criticism, which is going to happen. That's that's the game, yeah. isn't it? At the top level, yeah. but um, yeah, probably not the best business to be in if you get upset by the by the media having owning a news agent. Too, yeah, so. that's right. But uh, all, all was good on that occasion. Yeah, so you know, speaking of the West Indies, they they pretty much you know I, I I'm going to briefly touch on the '99 series because that was just an incredible series, but they've really been on decline since then, and to the point where they're largely irrelevant now, and which is really sad, really sad because that was one of the tours we I remember used to most look forward to seeing. But when was the last time Australia even toured for a Test series in the West Indies? I mean, it doesn't. I don't know. I haven't. I don't recall really one in the last um, five years, anyway. But well, I was I was selected when we were there last time. I, I think um, would have been five six years ago. Yeah, because I, I, I remember having my fiftieth birthday in Dominica as a oh, selector. Right. So right, I'm fifty six. So that's six years ago. Right. But you're right. The demise of West Indies cricket is is quite sad because they're so important to the the strength of world cricket at the moment. It's really India. Australia, New Zealand, and, and England, and the West yeah. Indies, they are they've got a few decent players, but for, for whatever reason, their crowds have dropped off. Yeah, they don't seem to have the facilities to you know provide um, you know a good uh, building block for for young players. The thing with the West Indies is you've got different islands, different countries, so it's a little bit segregated. Yeah, uh, in that way. So, uh, and American sports had a big influence, I think, on on the Caribbean. I, Maybe to a certain degree, so yeah, it's disappointing. But hopefully, they can you know get back up there. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. I I hope so too. But it just feels like it's it's, it's almost just too far gone now because you know you just like apart from Chris Gale, they just don't have anyone, and he's obviously uh, passed it as well now. But they just don't have that draw card. You know, they don't have that no. Viv Richards. They don't have that Kirtley Ambrose. Like again, watching highlights of that '95 Test. Curtly bowling bounces to you, and then the shirt's yeah. undone, and he's staring at you. And, and you know, I know yeah. Steve tried to fight him in Trinidad. I think it was as well. Like, <laughs> that was silly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they don't. You're right. They don't have the big names. I think. I think their captain Jason Holes about their best player, and they've got right. a few, a few young guys who have done bits and pieces, but nothing of the caliber of, of years gone by. So, I mean, they really focus on the short form cricket. T20 World Cups have yeah. won them. That seems to be their bread and butter, where the money is. So that's where a lot of their players sort of, you know, are focused on. Unfortunately. Yeah. So in '99, uh, you guys went back there. Steve's first game, first series, I think, as a uh, as a captain. In fact, um, 
as a touring captain. Um, and first test goes pretty pretty much to plan. Australia wins. And then that second test uh, was in uh, Ken- King- Kingston, I believe yep. it was. And uh, Brian Lara comes out and him and Jimmy Adams bat for an entire day. And Brian Lara plays one of the most sublime innings I've ever seen. Barely a false strike. He nearly got himself run out, though, actually on 99. He survived. But he played and the crowd, I mean, that was a real throwback to those, you know, early 90s, late 80s crowds. And what I want to ask you is, is, is what's it like? How hard is it to keep your concentration in a situation like that where Lara, I mean, you know, McGrath's coming in a bowling and, and, and I think McGill plot bowled as well. And he's just hitting everyone everywhere all over the place. How hard is it to just with the noise and the heat and the sounds and that for you to be like, I've got to be ready in case, in case a catch comes my way. Well, it's harder for the bowlers. So they're the one copying the stick, but yeah, as a, as a player and as a fields, I, I mean, it's great. I mean, the atmosphere is unbelievable. That's what you play for. You know, you're slightly up against it and the crowd's against you, big crowd, the great players, you know, batting beautifully. I mean, as a fellow opposition player, you know, I don't mind seeing guys like Lara and Viv Richards make runs against your Tendulkar. You know, they're the great players. So you, yeah. you, you quite enjoy it. Obviously, you want to get them out cheaply to win the game. But from a personal point of view, you know, it's it's spectacular when you're watching that, that sort of class of player making runs. Yeah. Um, and the atmosphere, yeah, I mean, I... I love it when you, you you're up against it and the crowd's ripping into you. I mean, that's you know you look at look at sport now this, with the COVID restrictions. Without a crowd, right. it's just so much different, isn't it? But yeah. um, oh. no, that's what you play for. You know, you you play to obviously win those games, but sometimes you you know the, the opposition are too good. And when Lara's on song, sometimes there's not much you can do about it except just you know sit back and watch it and clap what it, what he does. Yeah, I, I think it was McGill who threw a couple of full tosses in there as well, and it was just yeah, like, well, they would have uh, went into the grandstand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, that was Barbados was a great place to play. Um, yeah, you know, good good atmosphere, all those sorts of things. You know, you, I think there's a guy uh, he gets dressed up every every day and comes to the crowd, and they sort of he stands up and they all applaud him. And then there's a guy called Mayfair and Gravy in uh, Antigua. They get dressed right. up and come into the into the ground as well. So real characters, those you know, Caribbean crowds, and yeah, yeah, you know, lots lots of fun. Yeah, uh, I, I imagine it was, and, and again, I mean, Lara had another hundred and fifty in that series, and then he had another hundred. He had a hundred, uh, and I think the Windies were four for one hundred and thirty-eight at one point. I mean, it was a drawn series, but one yeah. of those just incredible, uh, like really good Test cricket. That's what that's what you sort of really miss with the Caribbean, uh, with yeah. the West Indies, because I just it's hard hard to picture yeah. that coming back. Well, you never know. Soon. There yeah. might be some young player pop out now, but I remember Brian Lara when I first played against West Indies. He was twelfth man about twenty Test matches in a row. Yeah, and he was he was getting so frustrated, and everyone was saying what a great player he was, but he just had to bide his time because there were so many great players in front of him. But um, yeah, they need someone like that to to really you know revitalise cricket in in the Caribbean. So uh, that that happened in '99, and then a couple of years later, Australia was on the uh, incredible run of victories, and it looked like we were going to win in India for the first time in about 30 years as well. Similar sort of yeah. situation. We were on top of them. Tendulkar goes in that second innings, and then uh, and then Lakshman and uh, Raul Dravid just Dravid. bat. They, I mean, they batted forever. Um, you know, Lakshman, that, that 280 is, is again also one of the most incredible innings I've ever seen because he just, it did not matter what the field was, who was bowling, he just hit everything. Um, you know, yeah. what, what was it like for you again? I mean, I know these are probably not great memories, but in, in terms of just being in that situation where Australia had been on such a dominant run and we were mm. about to win in a place that had been really tough to win in to go from that yeah. to then, uh, you know, like it turned around in one day basically. It did. Well, we, we won the first test, didn't we, in Bombay? Yeah. And then the second test was in Calcutta and Eden Gardens. And we, we, we've we pretty much, the first couple of days, we dominated that test match. We made yeah. India follow on. Yep. And I think it was a fair decision at the time uh, by Stephen. It was just a free partnership between Laxman and Drava, which turned the game. We just couldn't get a wicket. We, we bowled all day. I think I might have been bowling when Laxman got his 100. I think I served him up a nice full toss for him to get his 100. Um, bowling <laughs> that some was nice of you. But, yeah, but uh, I mean, that, that was just great play by India. And, and once again, Calcutta, Eden Gardens, it might have been about 80,000 people there. It was amazing um, atmosphere. So we lost the unlosable game there. And then the last two tests... Um, we had chance to win those as well. Even that last test in Madras, I think India got them eight down. 
Yeah. And there was a lot of close decisions that could have went either way. And unfortunately, they went against us. But that, that series was one of the best to play. And every test match was so close and, and such high quality that, um, you know, we probably deserved to win that series, to be honest. You know, I think we did, and, but we didn't. So that's, that's, that's the way it goes. Yeah, I mean, Harbajan was just in, everything he bowled just seemed to sort of. did get 30 odd wickets, I think. It's well, something crazy like that, yeah. Or something? Yeah, and, and, and I think that was the first time Gilly really struggled too, because Gilly had been batting so well. Uh, and I think he had like, you know, four innings in a row, he scored only two runs or something like that. He, he just. Yeah, he, got a, he got a couple of rough decisions, though. I remember yeah. one of them was a shocker. Yeah, um, yeah. There was a couple of LBs, but Punter struggled as well uh, with the yeah. spinners there. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was well, just again, you? yeah, that 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 uh, that atmosphere. Because you, you say eighty thousand. I remember, I think it was Tim Lane on the broadcast saying like there were no turnstiles though there. So like <laughs> they just kind of like they just decide, all right, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's about yeah, there's about eighty thousand yeah. in there. So, so let's go. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the conditions in India in those days, the pitches weren't too bad, but. When you first go in, that's when it's so tough. You need a bit of luck early on when the ball's spinning, your men around the bat, the crowd's roaring, the bowlers are fizzing, the umpire's in the game. You know, that's when it's so difficult. If you can get through the first half an hour, you know, batting is, is okay. But those first uh, half, you know, first dozen or so deliveries, you need a bit of luck. You, you yeah. really do. And, if, you know, quite often you, that's why there's so many low scores because it's so tough when you first go in. Someone once said, if you look good, you feel good. And if you feel good, you play good. Wise words, because the right outfit can bring out something special in all of us. And with Indochino, creating your best look yet could be more affordable than you think. Indochino offers completely custom fitted suits, shirts, casual wear, and more at surprisingly affordable prices. Every piece is made to your exact measurements and you can customize every detail. I recently ordered a pair of chinos with pleats and cuffs for that preppy 80s look. Ideal with a pair of penny loafers, but maybe you're not feeling the take IV approach. No problem, because with Indochino, you get to choose everything about your custom Johns. We're talking fabrics, lapels, monograms, statement linings, and more. Starting at just $399, Indochino suits include all those customizations to get you looking good on your terms at an affordable price. And you can do it all online if you want to. Nice. But Indochino is also open at select Nordstrom stores, giving you even more ways to get great fitting, personalized clothing. Find your nearest location at Indochino.com and right now, you can get $50 off any purchase of $399 or more by using code NODUNKS at checkout. That's $50 off a purchase of $399 or more at I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O dot com with promo code NODUNKS. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash NODUNKS. Life is pretty stressful right now, more so than it's ever been for a lot of people. Whether that's jobs, relationships, money, anything really, you may be feeling a little bit down and your temper may be a little bit shorter than usual. It's really important that you can unload and get that stress out and talk to somebody who's completely unbiased about anything to do with your life. Somebody who's not going to judge you or what you say or even take sides on anything. And sometimes... You can't tell anybody, but it's important that you find somebody who you can talk to. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stresses and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and No Dunks listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash no dunks. That's betterhelp.com slash no dunks. B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash no dunks. Well, uh, let's go back to when you did very first go in for Australia in, in 91 in Adelaide there. You, you'd had a long wait to get into the test team and, and, you know, under very unusual circumstances, you replace your brother 
in that lineup. But uh, yeah. then you just go out there and uh, stroke a, a hundred as if uh, you know you're just playing <laughs> backyard cricket again with the with the kids. I remember, you know, yeah. you take you took your helmet off and. I, you know Roger Federer. Whenever Roger Federer wins a Grand Slam, it looks like he's barely sweating. You took your helmet yeah. off as if it was like the easiest <laughs> run in the park. I mean, how much did it help you being a little bit older, a bit more mature, and and, and having to sort of bide your time so much? And, but also getting a taste playing for Australia in the One Day Games. Were you just so ready uh, for that for that moment in Adelaide in '91? Yeah. Well, I thought I was ready 12 months early, but we'll, we'll say <laughs> I was. It was perfect timing. But um, I think the main thing was I was in, in really good form. I'd scored a. a about 3,000 first-class runs that season, uh, if you count my county cricket with Essex. So yep. I was really in, in a rich vein of form. I think playing England uh, as well, I played against a lot of those guys in county cricket. I knew a lot of them, so I was quite comfortable playing against England and also batting at Adelaide Oval. As a batsman, that's probably you know one of your ideal scenarios to make a debut um, a test match You know, on a good batting track. We'd lost early wickets in that, yep. that particular day, I think three or four early ones. The hardest bit was batting with Greg Matthews, to be honest. He nearly run me out about 100 times. Um, that, that was the hardest bit of the innings. But um, as far as my own batting, it, it was I was sort of just in the zone. And, uh, you know, I don't think I hardly miss hit a ball, which doesn't happen yeah, too no, often. But no, it sort of happened no, that day. And I, just, I was just cruising, really. I'm yeah. just in the zone. I don't know how I got into the zone, but I wish I got in there a few more times because it was just, um, yeah, just like automatic, you know, automatic pilot, really, the way I played that day. Yeah, I mean, it was. It was It was incredible to watch. And, um, you know, obviously that sort of really put you in the team. But then you did have some rough patches uh, after that, not long after yeah. that. And, and you know, this is what I really want to ask you. Because in the 90s, in the early 90s, Australia had really good depth at that mid uh, – Mid sort of positions in the in the in the Australian team, we guys like Damien Martin, you know, blew it. Buff Lehman, Michael Bevan, Stuart Law, Jamie Cox. I mean, all these guys were making a ton of runs, and a couple of them did get a chance. You know, Mardo got a chance for Australia there. Greg Blewett, yeah. I, I think Greg Blewett made uh, a century in both his first two tests, and he made that yeah. double down in Johannesburg too. But did you feel, you know, were you looking over your shoulder a bit there when you had a bit of a rough patch here and there because it was well, such a pool of talent we had? Not, not really. I mean, I've, I must have, when I got dropped, I was pretty surprised because I debuted against England, did well in those tests, went to the West Indies, yep. did well over there, came back home. I think I had two or three bad test matches against uh, India. I got, I got a couple of bad decisions too, but I, I was actually batting pretty well. So, I mean, I must admit I was surprised I got dropped. Yeah. Uh, considering the start to my test career. And I, it wasn't that long into my test career, so I don't know who the bloody selectors were. They had no idea <laughs> um, dropping me. But uh, <laughs> I must admit I was pretty surprised yeah. when I got dropped. But, you know, these things happen. You're right, there was a good a lot of depth in um, the Australian squad uh, at that time. I think myself and Jeff Marsh got dropped in the same test match. And Tom Moody yeah. and a guy called Wayne Phillips, I think, from oh, Victoria yeah. came in. And took yeah, our spots. So. Yeah, I think we had five Victorians in the team at that point because um, it was a bit of a bit of a flex of the muscles from the Victorians. We had Phillips, Dean Jones, Merv, uh, Warney was probably in the team, and uh, maybe yeah. Tony Dottomate as well. Maybe. Well, that that was the problem. Five Victorians you know, <laughs> sh- should have been eight New South Welshmen. But uh, look, I must admit, I was. I was a bit surprised I got dropped, but anyway, these things happen, and you know, you just got to go back and score runs and get back in. So. And, and you did that, uh, and then the, the tour in 93 uh, of England was, was another very good tour for you in, in general. Uh, I want to I take you, though, to a, a moment that, you know, probably a bittersweet moment at Lords. Um, you, were, you, were, you were batting along just effortlessly there, and uh, then Phil Tufnell comes in, and, and he just gets one that sort of comes off your pads and onto the stumps. Yeah. 99 at Lords. I mean, uh, yeah. that's, that one's probably got to uh, hurt a little bit now still, does it? Yeah, I mean, it did. Yeah. Um, yeah, it did hurt a bit, particularly the way I got out. As you say, Phil Tuffle was bowling over the wicket, didn't bowl a particularly good ball, and I just tried to flick it through the onside to get a single. Uh, earlier in the over, I did the same, hit it really well and hit Robin Smith's shin pads and cost me getting the single. So I just tried to do the same shot. Unfortunately, missed it, hit my pad, went through my legs onto the stump. So, yeah, that, that's, that hurts, especially at Lords and getting, getting a 99 in any test match, but uh, yeah. particularly the, at the home of cricket. So... Yeah, annoying. If it, if it's any consolation, I, I it was uh it was my deb night that night. I was in year twelve, and uh, I had a bet with one of my friends that you were going to make a hundred at Lords, 
Yeah. And so we were out the back watching it and I'm just starting to count my money. I had a hundred bucks <laughs> on it here. Uh, anyway, uh, the girls were looking for us like, where are the boys? They, we were supposed to be doing some dances. We're out the back. You know, then all of a sudden, you know, anyway. yeah, <laughs> well, not only did I lose the hundred bucks in the end, I think I lost my girlfriend as well that night. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was the only one of the top four that didn't make a hundred in that particular yeah. thing. So yeah, let, yeah. let the team down and let yeah. you down as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, fortunately I, I i recovered from it but uh it was it was one of those funny moments where i was like because because again it was it was reminding me of adelaide it was like you were just scoring so easily um you know and, and i know that's that's one of the sort of things that that, that uh, followed your career people say well you know mark mark's too casual out there but um you know it wasn't that i know that i know i've read a lot and heard a lot about you like it was just the way that the game came to you and and, and i think i think a part of it was that it looked like you were sometimes halfway through a stroke before the bowler had even delivered the ball, especially <laughs> off your pads there. But, um, you know, what, what was it like for you hearing that sort of stuff and, 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 and you know, having to sort of be like, you know, that's, that's I'm not casual, I yeah. care, it means so much to me. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, it must be, it just must be well, tough, especially, especially when Steve had the opposite sort of reputation of like, you know, he's going to just bat until, you know, you almost have to shoot him to get him out, you know? Well, I mean, it's it's just it's just your style. It's, everyone looks plays in a different way, and obviously, I, you know, when you when your style is a bit casual looking, like a David Gower or Usman Khawaja, yeah. if you do get out, people think, oh, that's just a lazy shot. You, you know, you don't care, but that's just the way. You, it's just the way you play, and you, and you get labelled that um, in your career. It's hard to shake the label. I mean, Stephen was the opposite. He got labelled as being stodgy and yeah. That used to annoy him. He used to think he was a bit more flamboyant than, than what he was uh, given credit for. Uh, I mean, the only thing I would change if I look back at my career was when I got to 100, you know, I often got out, got 120 and got out right? because I thought the job was done. But, you know, if I went back in time, I'd really nail those hundreds into 200s or, you know, big hundreds. So that was the only thing that sort of let, I let myself down. But um, if, if I thought the game was in control or the innings was in control and I'd got my 100, I'd subconsciously I just seemed to get out for some yeah. you know which was a bit frustrating looking back but that, that's the way I played but yeah. you know it certainly wasn't any easier to me than the other player when, when you're no. batting it's just that's just your style it's just the way you, you come across to other people well you made 20 test centuries about uh, 15 times when you scored a century Australia won the match and there was four draws there was only one time where you scored a century and Australia lost the match any idea which one it was um, geez, now you got me. Um, where we? No, no, I can't remember. Where, where uh, against Pakistan, you had 116. I think it was in Sydney, actually. Uh, about 1996. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What, what, the, what the rest of the other blacks do? They? Uh, well, let me they check. I did, I did. I did have it up here before. <laughs> um, hang on. That's nice. that's New Zealand. That's that New Zealand here. I've got about a million tabs here still open nah. from uh, from all nah, the research. Okay. Well, let's just blame uh, the other blokes. I did my part. Well, yeah, did. yeah. Well, it, it, it was it was a good century, but uh, that was um, yeah. well, that was up against you know um, Wasim Akram, of course, and Wakar Yunus. I mean, th- those guys as well. Like Wasim, especially being the lefty. I mean, I, I'm guessing he was probably the toughest uh, you know non right hander that you had to face uh, throughout your career. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you're right. He's, he's one of the finest bowlers too. You know, he bowled he bowled quick. He could swing the ball, uh, had a short run-up. He was hard to pick yeah. up. You know, he had a quick arm action. He'd often run behind the umpire, then jump out at the last minute. He, he had all the skills. So he was fantastic. And Wacker Yunus was as well. He bowled quick. He was nasty. He could swing it as well. So they always almost ran off each other, a bit of a competition between each other so he could get the most wickets. So they were two um, fantastic bowlers, to be honest, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, was him, I, I mean, I know my Slats got 100 against Brisbane against the uh, Pakistan, but, uh, but Slats seemed to really struggle against Wasim with that late sort of in-swing. I mean, uh, you you probably wouldn't on, weren't on the ground at the same time then, but did you sometimes, when you're in the box there, like going, oh, this guy's not going to make any today. He just can't play this guy. I mean, I know Bluey, Bluey struggled with like Mushtaq Ahmad as well, you know, with those um, the, those revert or the uh, the googlies, I guess he was bowling to. I mean, is that is that something in the dressing room there? You're like, oh, I don't, just don't like this guy's chances against this player. No, uh, not really. I mean... No, yeah, I mean, you get a feel if blokes are in and out of form. There's right. no doubt about that. And everybody goes through it. So, 
if it's not you know it's not if it's not yourself struggling it's it's going to be someone else i mean you've got six batsmen in the team it's very rare that they're all in form at the one time right. so there's always one or two guys that that are struggling on tours or in australia so yeah i mean you do get a feeling for it but you you certainly just hope for the best for them and, and try and help them out in the nets or whatever if, if they're feeling a bit down but um that's where you need a good team so you know you can't all be doing well at the one time but um if you're a good side you can carry players who are a little bit out of form yeah and uh you know obviously you spent a lot of your career playing with steve how did it change did your relationship change at all when he became captain i mean did you have to sort of uh you know i know you know you you, you just kept going as normal i mean what about when he made everyone wear the baggy green caps because you were you were the broad brim guy i mean did that uh, yeah. cause any tension there no, not really. I, no, it's, our relationship didn't change once he was captain. Not, not really. No, he's. But I'm just one of the team, and Stephen's one of the other team members as well. That's the way you got to play. You're not going to get any every favours off your brother, and you don't expect them. And yeah, so you just treat each other as a, another team member, and that's that's the best way to keep it. Um, oh, obviously, you have those extra feelings being you know brothers and, and whatever, but. Um, yeah, you just you just you just playing. You're just one of the one of the team members, and, and that's the best way to keep it. I think. Well, Mark, listen, you've been very generous with your time here, so uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. But before we go, I've just got one more question for you, uh, and it's completely off the cricket field. It's back to the horses, because I know you're obviously uh, a, a big horse racing fan there. Yeah. Um, and I had Bruce McAvaney on this pod last year, and uh, obviously he's a, a huge horse racing fan as well. And so I pitched this fictional race to him, and I want to pitch it to you just to see who you think would win. So uh, imagine this. It's a Saturday afternoon at Rose Hill, beautiful day. Good track. Mm-hmm. The race is over 1,400 metres. And we've got uh, Winx versus Black Caviar. Uh, I don't know if you remember the Super Challenge back in 91, 92, Let's Elope and Better Loosen Up, but it's it's basically that mm-hmm. in a fictitious manner. Okay, we've got Luke Nolan on board, Black Caviar, Hugh Bowman on Winx, of course. Now, before I pitched it to Bruce, I asked a friend of mine who's a, who's a big punter as well. I said, you know, give me some, give me some odds. Give me a, some, some money lines here for this. And he's like, well, he says that the distance favoured Black Caviar, Black Caviar. a sprinter, but Winks needed another furlong or two. So he put Black Caviar at $1.70 and Winks at two twenty. So if mm-hmm. Mark War's got a few, uh, he's found five bucks down the uh, back of the couch and he can throw it on. Where, where's it going? Where's the money going? Oh, geez, great, great horses. Uh, I think 1,400 round Rose Hill. I think Black Caviar would lead and just have too much dash uh, for Winks. Winks would be winding up in the last 100 metres, but Black Caviar would just hang on and win. At a dollar seventy, so black caviar just. So you would have uh, you would have had a few winnings then that day if uh, if that race was to happen. Yeah, that's uh, that's the way I'd read. But yeah, no, I've been involved in horse racing all my all my life. Obviously, my wife's a, a well established trainer. Uh, we have a farm on the central coast where we we spell our own horses. So there's forty odd horses on the farm. So horses in the backyard out here. When I'm looking at the back, um, it's just a huge part of my life. Obviously, cricket with the commentary still there. Fox Sports. But horse racing is, is huge for us. We own a lot of horses. Kim trains a lot of horses. She's had great success. So it's pretty exciting. I mean, I don't have the adrenaline rush of playing top-level sport uh, anymore, but I have the adrenaline rush of, you know, horses racing in big races, and it's a big thrill, actually, if, if you have some success. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, when you're touring England um, or, you know, anywhere, really, if there's horse races, it gives you a, a little bit of an opportunity <laughs> to... No, but, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're on tour... I imagine that sometimes it gets a little bit tough when you're like you're a bit homesick yeah. or whatever, and uh, you know, so to be able to have something that's another passion of yours nearby, yeah. I, I imagine that's a lot of fun, especially if you're at a Royal Ascot, yeah. um, you know, yeah. some Derby wherever. Well, I've seen a lot of race courses overseas on cricket tours, um, Royal Ascot, but Barbados in the West Indies, it's one yeah. of the my favourite race courses to go to. Actually, the Barbados Cup was on there a number of times when we were, were touring, so I've been to race courses there, India. England, New Zealand. There's not a race course I haven't been to in, a, in another country. So, hey, have you been you know, to the Ricky, uh, Ricky Ponting? His nickname's Punter. So, yeah. you know, he was always keen on the races as well. So, yeah, it was always always a good uh, a good way to to stop thinking about the cricket. Yeah, is he still? He, he was the big greyhound uh, man, wasn't yeah. he, Punter? Yeah, he was. He... But he's, he's had a, he's had a few horses too. He's had a few horses. Right. My wife's trained. And he's had shares in. So, right. He, he's an all rounder. He loves greyhounds and and the, the thoroughbreds as well. I hope you're getting a commission off those uh, that he's investing there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is the uh, Kentucky Derby or any of the the US horses at all on your on your radar? I mean, obviously not right now. Things things aren't uh, great, but yeah, at some point. Yeah, would love to 
to come to the Kentucky Derby. So it's definitely on the, the to-do list when we can get out of our own country. So yeah, for sure. Yep. I think Kentucky's a beautiful part of the world. A lot of the, the studs up there and obviously the Kentucky Derby. So yeah, definitely want to get there one day. All right. Well, Mark, this has been uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you about uh, so many fantastic moments in your career. And uh, and look, uh, hopefully, yeah, you can you can get out and get over to the Kentucky Derby and yeah. uh, you know pack a few winners from there one day. All right, Lee. Good to talk to you, mate. I've lost my voice now for talking so much. So. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, Mark.